Revelation chapter 2 is where we are picking up tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are praying that you would meet us here tonight. Lord, that you would really speak into our lives. And Lord, as this uh, is a word that you've spoken to the churches. And Lord, you said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Lord, may we have an ear to hear tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon us in these days. Lord, we pray that you would, Lord, touch and cleanse and empower us as your people. Lord, we pray that you would draw many to yourself, Lord, in these days. Lord, we pray that you would move mightily across this land and around the world, Lord, to save many. Thank you for the great things you're doing, and Lord, thank you that we're part of that, and Lord, we just want to see you do all that you desire to do. So Lord, whatever that takes on our part, uh, if it's prayer, if it's uh, more commitment in our lives or whatever the case, Lord, just work that in us, we pray. Lord, we just ask that you would touch and bless and speak to us tonight. And Lord, again, we lift up all of those in harm's way Lord, be with them. Lord, draw those who don't know you to yourself, those who aren't right with you, get them right with you. Those that are, bless, keep, and use them. And Lord, just have your way in all these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So as we come to the second chapter, we come now to the second part of the book of Revelation. Remember, verse 19 gives us the outline for the book. Jesus said there to John, Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So John wrote the things that he had seen, and those are the things that he recorded there in what we know as the first chapter of the book of Revelation, that vision of Christ there with the, uh, the stars in his right hand, and there in the midst of the golden lampstands. And now we are going to address the things that are, the things that pertain to the church. And then when we finish dealing with the things that pertain to the church, we will then go on to address the things that will happen after the age of the church has come to a close. The church began, of course, with the a resurrection of Jesus. And the, uh, the day of Pentecost was sort of the, the public display of the birth of the church, although technically it was already existing. And the church has, of course, been in the world since that time. But the church will, at a certain point in the future, be removed from the world. And then the things that pertain to the church will have come to an end and we will enter into a whole new, uh, what you might call a dispensation, a whole new dealing of God uh, with the inhabitants of the world and that will be in that period that we commonly call the tribulation. But before all of that, Jesus is going to speak to his church and Again, in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden lampstands. He tells us here really that in these seven letters, there's, there's something that 
is somewhat of a mystery or had been somewhat of a mystery, uh, he's going to unfold that mystery now. And, and the mystery is really this, that all of the history of the church is seen in these seven churches. And so as we're looking at these letters to the seven churches, we, we have to keep in mind, first of all, that they were written to seven literal historical churches. But yet the issues that are addressed in those churches would be the issues that the church would experience all throughout its history. And so at any given time in history, you can find any one of these seven uh, possibilities uh, somewhere within the church in the world. But then, of course, churches are made up of individual people. And so it also has application for us individually, that we as individuals might find ourselves personally in uh, one of these places that are described in these letters to the churches. So as we go through these letters to the churches, we want to look at them. We want to look at both the collective aspect, how uh, it applies to the church. Well, we'll, we'll you know, look at how it applied to the church then, how it applies to the church now, but then we want to bring it down to the personal level. And so, chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate." He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so, to the church in Ephesus, this letter comes. The church in Ephesus was established by none other than the Apostle Paul himself. So here is a church that has a rich, rich heritage founded by the Apostle Paul. It is a church that had as its pastor at some point, Timothy, Paul's son in the faith. It is a church that also had as it's uh, perhaps you might say visiting pastor occasionally, John himself. And so here is a, a church that has just a tremendous foundation, an apostolic foundation. And it is a church that is full of all kinds of wonderful activity, all kinds of great things going on. It was, just, uh, it was just a great church. It was, you know, this was the kind of church that you would travel all around the world to get to. We want to go to the church in Ephesus. We want to be there and see what God is doing. It's a powerful, powerful ministry taking place there. But in the midst of all of that, all of those great things that were going on as time had passed. Now, of course, this letter was written uh, several years after the founding of the church. And if uh, some of the dates are right that we mentioned previously, that it was uh, about 95 AD that John 
probably wrote this. That's debatable, but if it was, then the church had been around for some, uh, you know, 40 years or so, if not longer. And so now quite a, quite a bit of time has passed. And although there's still all of these great things going on, all of this activity, something's happened where in the heart of the people, there's been a moving away from that love for the Lord as the motivating factor. And this is the thing that Jesus puts his finger on. You know, as exciting as it is to have a church that is, um, you know, full of good works, a church that perseveres through challenging times, a church that is committed to a biblical morality, a church that is defending and promoting sound doctrine and contending for the faith. These were all the things that the Ephesian church uh, were committed to. And, and then the Lord even says that he, he goes back again to the perseverance and the patience and the labor. So he stresses that. So these guys were working hard for the Lord. And, and from, the, from the outside looking in, I don't think that any person would have necessarily detected that there was something defective that was going on. Because as you looked at it, it just seemed to be the greatest thing happening. But you see, Jesus looks beyond all the outward activity and there's something that's taken place deep inside the hearts of the people. And that's what he is addressing here. Now, I want you to notice that this is addressed to the angel, it says, of the church in Ephesus. Remember, the word angel, I think it's an unfortunate um, translation here. Because when we think of angel, we think of angels. We think of supernatural beings. But this is clearly not an angel in that sense. But the word, as I've told you before, the word simply means a messenger. This letter is addressed to the, the pastor of the church, the overseer of the church at Ephesus, whoever that was at the time. All of these letters are addressed to the pastor, to uh, the leadership of the church, if you will. And it's interesting because what that shows us is that the leadership of the church, to a large degree, is responsible for the condition of the church. And Jesus holds the leadership responsible. And of course, as the leadership goes, so the people will go. And as Jesus is addressing this uh, messenger or the pastor, the overseer of the church, he's speaking directly to him. But in that word to him, he's addressing the entire body. And so it seems that this is something that had happened from the top right on down to the bottom. And it happened from the pastor right to the very people sitting in the pew. And like I said, to a large degree, that's going to be the case. A pastor has a great influence over a church. And wherever the pastor is at in his heart, that is ultimately where the church is going to end up. So he addresses the pastor. And again, he gets ultimately to this issue of the heart. He, he commends them initially, as we pointed out. There was one other thing there that he said concerning them, that he commended them for, 
And that was that they also, as did he, hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Who were the Nicolaitans? This has been a question that many have asked on down through the ages. Uh, there isn't any thing left in the historical records of the church that specifically defined for us who the Nicolaitans were. Some say that they were a sect who followed a heretical man named Nicholas. And he was heretical in that he led people off into a false teaching and immorality and things of that nature. Uh, I personally don't think that was the case because uh, Jesus has other ways of addressing that, which he will address in some of the other letters to the churches. I think the best way to understand this term, the Nicolaitans, is to, is to look at it from the standpoint of the, the meaning of the word itself. And the meaning of the word is simply to rule over the laity. And so what it seems was beginning to surface early on was this idea that there would be a professional clergy that would be spiritually superior to the laity and would rule over them. And we know in church history that uh, early on in, in the development of the church, there, there came about this type of uh, situation where there was eventually set up a priesthood that had to mediate for the people. But Jesus commends the church in Ephesus for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans because he hated their deeds also. The Lord came to do away with the necessity of any human mediation. See, under the Old Testament, there was a necessity for human mediation. The average person could not go directly to God. They had to go first through the priest. They had to go through a sacrifice being taken to the priest. And it was only through that mediation of the priesthood that they could actually come into communion with God. Jesus came to do away with all that. And it's such a sad and tragic thing that in the history of the church, there was ultimately erected in a large portion of the church this, this Nicolaitan system that kept the people out from personally encountering God and set up uh, a medi mediatorial uh, group, a, a priesthood. So these are the, the things that Jesus commends them for but then we see here that despite all of the good things that are going on, there's something amiss. There's something that's not right. And in verse 4, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. It's so easy for Christianity to become a, a routine for us. It's so easy for us to get into the habit of doing certain spiritual things, but moving away from the original motivation which came from our hearts which was born simply out of love for who God is. It's so easy for that to happen. You know, I think we've all probably had the experience of, of maybe carrying some heavy burden around. And I'm not talking about an emotional burden, but it could be that. But, you know, physically, we've all had the experience of maybe having to carry something. Maybe you're moving or, you know, you've got to pick up the the end of the couch or you, a refrigerator or a piano or something and, you know, you're carrying this thing and you feel like you're not going to make it, your, your arms are going to fall off. Uh, you know, finally you get to your destination, you set it down and, you know, whew, what a relief. And, and you sense that relief. You, you've set that weighty thing down and you, you feel so good that you've been able to unload that burden. 
But you know, it's not too long before you even forget that you were lifting the thing. It, it just sort of passes. And you know, sometimes that happens to people spiritually as well. We come to Jesus and he delivers us from the burden of our sin. And initially we're so blessed. We're so excited. We're so thrilled. We're so thankful to have been relieved of this great burden. But after a while we start to sort of get used to being relieved from it. And we forget how heavy it was. It's so easy to forget that. Peter talks about those who fail to add to their faith, fail to grow in Christ, and he said their problem is that they have forgotten that they were purged from their old sins. And it's possible to get to a place where I forget what it was like before I was saved. I forget the bondage of sin. I forget how my life was so dark and meaningless. And because I've been saved for a while, I start to take my salvation for granted. And that initial thankfulness and all of that love that flowed out of my heart because I was so grateful for what God had done for me, it starts to sort of grow cold because I've forgotten how glorious my deliverance was. It's happened to many people. It's happened to many. And so Jesus here is addressing a group of people who are doing all the right things, but they're doing them from the wrong motive. The motive is no longer love for Jesus. The motive is no longer just that simple, pure love for Christ. The motive's were not necessarily bad motives. They were not necessarily selfish motives or anything like that. But they were not motivated out of that simple, pure love for Christ. And any motivation that's not rooted in our love for Jesus is not a valid basis for service to Him. You know, the Lord did not save us, first and foremost, so that we could be his servants. The Lord has many servants. He has all of the angels. They are serving him, and they are much better servants than we are. They're much more cooperative. They're much more powerful. They're much more effective. So it wasn't like the Lord came to save us because, well, I, I need a bunch of people to serve me to get my, you know, plan accomplished. No, Jesus saved us for love. He saved us first and foremost for fellowship. Service is something that is, it just flows out of our fellowship with him, or it ought to. And if it doesn't, then it's service that he's not really He's not wanting to accept that service because that's not the real reason that he died on that cross. That's not the real reason that he shed his blood. It's not the real reason that he came to this earth. The real reason is because he loves you and he loves me and he wants us to know him and he wants to have a relationship with us that is deep and intimate. And so to this church, as wonderful as it was, he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. That is serious. When Jesus says, I have got something against you, we better perk up. We better listen to what he has to say. I have this against you. You have left your first love. Think about it. What are the marks of love? You know, when, you, when you're in love, when you, when you love, and not just in love in the romantic sense, but, you know, when you love somebody, what, what are the marks of love? Well, one of the chief marks of love is desire for that person, right? You desire that person. You want to be with that person. You want to be with them as much as you possibly can. 
course, we know that's true in uh, the, the romantic sense. You fall in love with somebody and you can't stand to be away from them. But not only in the romantic sense. When you love people, you just, you love being around them like your family. We love being with our kids. We love being with our grandchildren. And we're upset that we can't be with them more often. Because we love them. And we just, we just so desire to be with them. But a second mark of love is delight. You delight in those that you love. They're just, you know, they walk into a room and you just, you light up. Oh, it's you. You're here. Great. See, there is that emotional element. But along with love, of course, there would be gratitude. You're thankful. You're thankful for the relationship. You're thankful for all of the, the things that are involved in that relationship. There's, there's a heart of gratitude. And then there would be an anxiousness to please. We want to please those that we love. And just out of love for them. I want to please them. I want to do what... What will bless them. But also with love, there's sacrifice, isn't there? And when you love somebody and you sacrifice for them, in a sense, although it is sacrificial because maybe you're giving up something that's precious to you or you're, you're uh, denying yourself a certain thing because you want to benefit the other person or bless them... Uh, Yet when you really love somebody, in a sense, it's, it doesn't even seem like a sacrifice, does it? It's like, oh, it doesn't matter. No, I'll easily forego that. I, no, it does. Here, you take it. No, it's because you, you love them. Those are the things that mark love. And when we think of those things in relation to the Lord, what is, what is Jesus talking about when, he's, when he uses this term, your first love, what... What is he referring to? Well, he's referring to those kinds of things that we desire him and the things that he delights in, the things that he loves, that we delight in his word, that we delight in his will, that we are full of gratitude toward him. And we're just, we're motivated by that gratitude. Oh, I'm so, I'm so thankful for what Jesus did for me. What can I do for him? We are anxious to please him. We're concerned about the things we're doing in life because my question is, does this please the Lord? Is the Lord going to look favorably upon this? And we're ready to sacrifice, but in reality, it's not, it's not really a sacrifice. Because after all, look at what Jesus did for me. Paul the Apostle put it this way. He said, the love of Christ constrains me. The love of Christ compels me. He, he said, the motivating factor in my life is love for Jesus Christ based upon his love for me. And he said, this is how I see it. He said, since one died for all, then all died. And we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and the one who rose again. You see, that was how Paul looked at the situation. That's what motivated him. That's what compelled him to do the things that he did. That was the constraining factor in his life. It was the love that Jesus had for him, that if Jesus would die for me, how could I do anything less then if need be, give my life for him. And this is the thing that the Lord is addressing with that church in Ephesus. But, remember, it's not just that church in Ephesus that these things were written to, for. It's this church right here, tonight. It's, it's this local body. 
And you know, it's interesting because as you look at the, the commendation element, I think that we as a, as a church, and even, I'll take it a step further, even as a group of churches, because we belong to a, a movement of churches. But I think that as a movement of churches, we have some strong similarities to Ephesus. Now, most of the time I hear Calvary Chapel is the Church of Philadelphia. And uh, I hope we are. But the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Ephesus were very, very similar in one respect, but they were very different in another respect. And I, I wonder and I, I'm concerned maybe... We, in thinking we're one because we're comparing ourselves with certain similarities, maybe we ought to be careful that we don't end up going over and becoming more like the other. But look at the things again that he mentions here. Your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil. You've tested those who say they are apostles. You've found them to be liars. You've persevered, have patience, and you've labored for my name's sake, and you haven't become weary. I think that that's a a fairly accurate description of Calvary Chapel. We're working for the Lord. Look at the magazine. That's just an example of all the different things that are going on all over the world uh, through the various ministries of Calvary Chapel. And people are laboring. And we are involved in promoting the word of God and standing up against evil and holding fast to sound doctrine and contending for the faith against those who are Contrary. We are very much like Ephesus in that sense. But would Jesus say to us as a body, collectively, would he say to us, nevertheless, I have this against you? You've left your first love. Has it become a routine? Has it just become a habit? Has it just become this is the thing that you do because you're a Christian and this is what Christians do and you do it almost uh, effortlessly now? You do it without a whole lot of thinking. You do it without a whole lot of emotion. There's not a whole lot of prayer involved. You just, this is what we do. We've got the means to do it. We see that this is the need and of course this is the right thing and we're going to do it and we're serving God and we're blessed. This is a subtle thing that Jesus is addressing here. It's something that's not easily detected on the surface. It's something that's in the heart. It's something that the Lord sees that another person might never see. But the Lord sees it. You have left your first love. And then, of course, there is that personal application. Have we, as individuals, been guilty of leaving our first love? Have we been so involved in Christian service and good works and things of that nature that we've substituted those things for our relationship with the Lord. You know one of the most dangerous elements of ministry. You won't, most people don't realize this. Everybody in ministry knows it's true. The pastor, those in the type of ministry that that I'm in, that Pastor Chuck's in, that we as the, the pastoral leadership of the church, we know the very real danger and possibility of substituting the ministry 
for our relationship with Jesus. Finding satisfaction through the ministry. Finding fulfillment through the ministry. And no longer finding that just simply in the Lord. It's a danger that every pastor faces and to some degree or another lives with constantly. And so there's that constant challenge to keep ourselves in that place where we are doing this with the right motive. And this is something that over and over again I have to have a heart check on. Over and over again I have to go back. And there are times that I find that I am doing all the right things, but my heart is somewhere else. It's no longer motivated simply out of love for Christ. Every person in ministry needs to ask themselves the question, what would I do if ministry was taken away from me tomorrow? What would my Christian life look like if I had no ministry opportunity? Would I still have a Christian life? Or has my whole Christian experience just become all about the ministry, all about these things that I do for God? You see, we can do all kinds of things for God and neglect the God we're doing them for. It's totally possible. That's possible to do that on a human level, isn't it? You can work yourself to death for your family. You want, to, you want them to have a nice home to live in and you want them to have uh, the best of the best and you want them to go to the best schools and you want them to, you know, to succeed in life and so you work yourself to death and, because you love them but you never took the time to actually tell them you love them or to spend any time with them, uh, hugging them or taking them out for any personal time together or anything like that. You, you love them so much that you ended up somehow neglecting them because you were trying to do all these things for them but missing the main thing they needed you to do. That happens spiritually. What is the solution to this condition? Well, listen to what Jesus said. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent, And do the first works. So there's three things basically here that Jesus tells us to do. Number one, he says, remember. Number two, he says, repent. And number three, he says, in essence, repeat. Remember what? Remember from where you have fallen. You see, we all start out in that place of just simply loving the Lord. I remember when I got saved and I was so in love with Jesus, I would do anything for him. And the thought of doing anything for him was so thrilling. No matter how difficult the task, no matter how insignificant the task might have seemed, didn't matter. If I could just do something for the Lord. Oh, Lord, I love you so much. I am so thankful that you saved me, that you pulled me out of that pit of sin that I was, I was stuck in. Lord, anything. And I remember back in those early days for me, I remember working in a surf shop down in Huntington Beach. And just going each and every day to work. And they're just, okay, Lord, what can I do for you today? How, how, can, I, how can I serve you? And, and looking for those opportunities to tell people about Christ and what he'd done for me. And, and looking for that homeless guy on the street that I could go out and give some money to, buy him some lunch, talk to him about the Lord. You know, looking for that person that I could help. Oh, there's a person in distress. Let me pull over and see what I could do for them. Because I might get to tell them about the Lord. And let me get down to the church early so I could help set up over there. Because, man, Lord, I just want to be there. And I just want want to do something for you.
And those same kind of people, like myself, and like you perhaps, those same kind of people can come to a point where they're still serving the Lord in the sense that they've got the position, but it's like, oh no, oh gosh, oh here comes somebody I've got to pray with. Oh, I'm too tired to pray with anybody. Oh, what do you mean I've got to stick around a little later? You know, I need to get home. I come early and do what? Oh, no, not that homeless guy again. Oh, man, I just can't. You know, Jesus says, remember. Remember from where you've fallen. Remember how it used to be. Remember how you were just so in love with me that anything didn't matter. The smallest little thing was like, oh, Lord, if I could just do that for you, that would be so great. He says, remember how that was. Remember how it was. You couldn't wait to get to church because, man, this is the place where you could worship God. This is the place where you could hear more about him, learn more about him. You couldn't wait to get back with those uh, fellow believers because that you could pray together. You could encourage one another. You could go out and serve the Lord together. Jesus said, remember. Remember from where you have fallen. All that stuff that you were doing in the world, man, you were so blessed to just be freed from it. You were so just thankful to have been delivered. It's like, you know, what has that got to do with me? I'm not interested in that. I don't, I, I, no, I, it doesn't hold any interest to me whatsoever anymore. It's not attractive it's not what I want to be involved in. But then again, time passes and it's like, oh, that was, you know, that wasn't all that bad. That was, that was, there was some cool elements to that. And, you know, this is what happens. Jesus said, remember. Remember from where you have fallen and repent. What does the word repent mean? Well, to simplify it, it simply means to turn and go back in the direction that you had previously been going. The word actually means <clears throat> to have a change of thinking. Repent. <clears throat> have a change of thinking. <clears throat> have a change of thinking that results in a change of direction. So Jesus says, remember from where you've fallen and repent Turn around and go back to those things that you were doing. And then repeat. Repeat those things. Do the first works. Go back and do the things that you did when you first got saved. Go back and do the things that you did simply because you were so thankful and so full of love for Christ that your whole world ultimately really revolved around him. Go back and do the first works. Now notice, they are doing works and he commends them for works. But then he tells them, go back and do the first works. He's not saying, you know, get more involved. Do more things around the church. Go on more missions trips. Go and, you know, out with the team and reach the homeless people on the streets. And, you know, get down there and get involved in the Sunday school and all that. They're doing all of that stuff. Go out and defend the faith. And they're doing all of that already. That's not what they need to go back and do go back to the first works the first works of just the simple personal love and devotion to Christ you see that's the thing that the Lord redeemed us for Jesus redeemed us listen this is real simple Jesus redeemed us first and foremost so every day you would take time to just open your Bible and spend time with him 
Jesus redeemed us so every day we would say, Lord, I love you. Lord, I, I want your will in my life. Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, here I am. Jesus redeemed us so we would personally come and commune with him. That's what the whole act of the cross was all about. Remember what we're told in Hebrews? That the veil, the veil that kept man out from the presence of God, Jesus did away with that veil. Remember when Jesus cried out on the cross? His last words, it is finished. And we are told that the veil that was in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. That veil signified that man could not come into the presence of God because of sin. Jesus died on the cross first and foremost to rip that veil in two to open the way for us to walk in and say, Hi, God, Father, here I am. Your lost, rebellious son, I've come home. That's, that's what he did it for. He didn't do it to make us a bunch of little robot servants. He only wants us serving him out of that, Lord, I, I'm just so great, grateful to be saved. What can I do for you? You've done so much for me. You see, that's the way it's supposed to be. So when we are caught up in all of this activity and all of these other things, we're doing, 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 doing this and that and the other thing for God, but we're not spending any time with Him. We're not communing with Him. We're not just sitting there and just in our hearts just thanking Him and, and, and loving Him and showing our love for Him by the fact that we're obeying Him because it's not just a bunch of lip service, of course. It's not just a bunch of feelings. There's action to it. But the Lord redeemed us for the primary purpose of personal communion. That we might know Him. That, that's what God said the new covenant would be all about. That all will know me from the least to the greatest. All will know me. And the word no is a word that implies no experientially. Now there is a warning. The warning is this. He says, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now think about this. What is he talking about? Removing the lampstand. Well, remember the picture that we saw in chapter 1? Jesus, where is he? He's in the midst of the golden lampstands. And what he's warning about is the possibility of the lampstand being moved outside of his presence. That he... In other words, would no longer be in our midst. You know, a church where Jesus is no longer in the midst of the church is a sad and tragic place. Jesus wants to dwell in the midst of his church. He wants his presence to be sensed. He wants to be here so that when we come here, gather here. Well, of course, we, when we gather because we're the body, we gather in this building. But when we gather here together, he wants to be here with us. He wants to be present. He wants to be blessing us with his presence. But he will not remain in the midst of a church, in the midst of a body of people that do not love him first and foremost any longer. And 
there have been and there still are and there will be more. Many churches, they're doing all the right things. They've got a list longer than this one here of all the good things they're doing. They're doing all the right things. They be, they're believing all the right things. They're contending all of those things. But there's a conspicuous absence of the presence of God in those assemblies. Why? Because it's rote. Because it's become a routine. Because it's, it's external. But the heart has become disengaged. You know, ironically, you know the field of apologetics, of course, is the, the area of defending the faith, studying to, you know, contend for the faith and so forth. I have known many apologists over the years, very bright people, very well educated, got all of the arguments, can defend the faith, can just destroy any kind of opposition that comes along. But you know, quite honestly, I have met very few apologists that had a, just a, an overflowing sense of, of God's presence with them. They know all the right things. They say all the right things. I'm not saying I haven't met any, but I, it, it's kind of an irony. But I've only met a few that you realize that with this person, it's, it's all about love, really. At the end of the day, they, they simply love the Lord. And at the end of the day, that's the thing that Jesus is calling for. And you see what will happen on an individual level as well is we can come to a place where Again, we're doing the right things. We're believing the right things. We're even, we're even debating and contending and arguing for the faith. But the presence of the Lord is not with us. We don't really sense His presence. We're not really hearing His voice or, or sensing His guidance. And if that's the case, we have to come back and say, where is my heart? Have I left my first love? And to just really go before the Lord and say, Lord, search my heart. And Lord, remind me if need be. If I have fallen, where, where have I fallen from? Help me, Lord, to go back and do those first things. And then... The exhortation that's given in each and every one of these letters. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then the promise. At the end of each of these letters, the Lord gives a promise. And listen to this one. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Turn over to Revelation 22. Verses 1 through 5. This is what Jesus is talking about. To him who overcomes, this is, this is the inheritance of the overcomer. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. They shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That is the promise that Jesus is giving there to the overcomer. We will live and reign with him forever and ever.